as you're taking your seat, you can open your Bible to 1 Peter. Uh, we are marching through 1 Peter, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, the Word of God is calling us to have a living hope, a hope that isn't just conceptual in nature, but results in a practical way of life. And we saw last week that the Word of God calls us, compellingly so, to live holy lives, to live lives of moral purity, because the God who has saved us, the God who fills us, is himself pure and righteous and holy. And here in 1 Peter, Peter wants to motivate us towards this kind of holy living. The Word of God, I love it, it meets us where we're at. It realizes that we struggle to do what it calls us to do. And so God in his grace and kindness continues to try to fuel us towards righteous living, towards holiness, to give us the necessary elements that make that possible. And here we see that the requirement for living a holy life is to live in fear. And that's a strange way to to think of the motivation for a holy life. Living in fear doesn't seem like the appropriate answer, and yet the Word of God from cover to cover promotes this theology of fear, a fear-based living. Now bear with me if this seems strange to you, but let me just remind you a little bit of what the Word of God actually says. It says, let me just quote from Proverbs. Proverbs is a book that's filled with this concept, but the whole Word of God really is. Here's what Proverbs 1, 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It says this in chapter 2, verse 5, but the fear of the Lord, by it we find the knowledge of God. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, Proverbs 8, 13 says. The fear of the Lord, according to the book of Proverbs, prolongs life. It provides strong confidence, and it is the fountain of life. It is the place from which all of life erupts and bursts forward and finds satisfaction and flourishing and health. The early church is said in the book of Acts to have walked in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It was this fear of the Lord that characterized the way they lived their lives This fear of the Lord was so dominant among them that outsiders took note of it. It changed the way they approached society. It changed the way they approached marriage. It changed the way they approached their decisions of their life. Everything was affected by the fear of the Lord. And God blessed their fear and he multiplied the church because of their fear. You know, godly men and women not too long ago were often referred to as God-fearers. It was commonplace to ask people if they were a God-fearer. And yet I would suggest that this term and and this understanding of the fear of God has somewhat fallen out of fashion, but it is a term that is deeply biblical and needs to be revived in our hearts and in our minds, and I pray that God does that this morning. Maybe this term, the fear of God, sounds somewhat offensive to you, It is certainly offensive to our contemporary culture. Maybe you've been so influenced by culture that even as a Christian, this term fear of God sounds offensive to you. Maybe it sounds harsh and unkind and uncaring. Maybe it sounds domineering and demanding. Maybe it simply seems out of step with how we want to perceive and define God. We can't believe that the God that we want to follow would call us also to fear him. We're so consumed with defining God by his love that we've actually clouded our understanding of what that love actually means about the character of God, and we've actually allowed it to exclude other aspects of the character of God. We have perhaps a very unhealthy view and understanding of the, word of, of the, uh, the way God defines himself in his word. We might ask in our day and age, where has all the fear of God gone? Where are the God-fearers? Maybe it's better to ask yourself that question this morning. Maybe this is the most important question you can ask um, in your entire life. I would suggest it is. Do I fear God? Do I have a fear of the living God? And does that fear make a difference in how I live my life. 
Peter here in verses 17 through 21 of chapter 1 gives us one long sentence. All of these verses making up one long sentence that explain our motivation towards holy living. And here Peter tells us that the fear of God is an essential but often neglected component to living a godly life, to living a life that is pleasing to the Lord God Almighty. You see, fear of God is the fuel for holy living. And that's what we need to fan back into flame this morning in our hearts. The fear of God itself must be fueled if we are to allow it to fuel our holiness. That's exactly what I want us to look at this morning. How do we fuel our fear of God? How do we understand the fear of God? And how does this fear of God compel us to live in a manner that's pleasing to the God who has called us by his own glory and grace? Here Peter says this, Beginning in verse 17, let's read it together. He says this, And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Peter wants to increase our understanding of the fear of God because he wants to increase the holiness of our lives and the honor and glory that is then given to God. So this is what we're doing this morning. We're looking at God's word and we're going to evaluate this theme of the fear of God and we're going to see how the fear of God is actually fueled in our lives and therefore fuels holiness in our lives. So notice this first in verse 17 we see the fear of God is fueled by a greater awe of God. The fear of God is fueled by a greater awe of God. That is what is required. You and I must have a greater awe of God, a greater reverence of God, a greater picture of the majesty of God. If that is going to produce a greater fear of God in our lives and greater holiness in our lives. There are really two aspects to the fear of God that we see identified throughout Scripture. There is the fear of terror or dread, you know, the scared kind of fear, the trembling kind of fear, to be in the presence of somebody who is utterly terrifying. That is described in Scripture many times over. But the other side of fear is the kind of fear that Christians are called to live in, and that is a fear of veneration, a fear of reverence, a fear of awe. When the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, it's speaking not so much, not so much, let me qualify that, of the fear of terror, but of this fear of awe. But I want you to understand that both aspects of this fear are necessary. They're essential to understand if we're going to rightly stand in awe of God. We must understand that God is a God to be feared. And in the proper context, God, we should rightly excuse me, be scared of God. We should be terrified of the reality of meeting God, especially apart from Jesus Christ and in our sin. And we cannot appreciate and rightly stand in awe of God unless we understand this kind of picture of God. And here what we see is this, that Peter wants to describe for us who God is. He's called us to be holy like God is holy, and now he wants to ground this call to be holy in the very character of God. And he describes God in two really dominant ways. First, he tells us this, that if we want to be growing in our awe of God, we need to be those who call on God as Father. Do you notice how he says that in verse 17? He says, and if you call on him as father, th this idea, uh, an understanding of God as father is something that is not new to the New Testament. It was common for Israel, in one sense, to look at God as Father. Many scriptures reference God as Father in the Old Testament. But really, here in this specific context, it links us back to the previous section where we are told that we are to be obedient children. 
There is this familial relationship that we're supposed to remember when it comes to our standing with God, and we're supposed to identify ourselves as obedient children and God as a loving, gracious Father. To call on God as Father is a reminder, listen, of our identity as children of God. It's a reminder of the character and nature of God, that God is a Father, that God is the authority figure, that God is the one that we strive to honor and obey with our behavior. And so it is therefore a reminder of our mission. As children of God, we do not live for our own glory. We do not live for the respect of others. We do not live for our reputation. We live for the honor, for the respect, for the dignity, for the praise of our great heavenly Father. Amen? This is our mission. At the very heartbeat of everything we do as children of God, we live for him and for his glory. This is not primarily about us, it's primarily about him. And we are supposed to look like him so that we might rightly represent and reflect him to the world around us. This is the calling of the word of God on our lives. It's also a reminder, just this term father, of the kind of relationship that we get to enjoy with the God of the universe. God is a creator, yes, but he's not a distant creator, a creator in which, uh, with whom excuse me, we can have no intimacy or fellowship. He is a creator who is drawn near to us and has created us to actually live in intimacy with him, in divine union with him, in fellowship and communion with him. He invites us into this relationship. He reminds us that this is the purpose for which we have been created, to know him, to love him, and to live for him. As children, this is a reminder that we want to be pleasing to our Father. How fitting on a day where we dedicate children to be reminded of this truth. Children ought to look at their parents and long to be pleasing in their sight. It's amazing, isn't it? When you look at little children, especially at a very young age, uh, maybe less so when they get into the teenage years, but at a very young age, children actually delight. They really do. They delight in their parents' approval and acceptance. Teenage years, they're like, whatever, I don't care. Young age, they, they love it, right? They, a, a young child, I love looking at my young son, my youngest son, he's four years old, and I love, I love when I shower praise on him, when I tell him he's doing such a good job. I love watching his face just glow. He lights up with pleasure at the Father's pleasure in him. But isn't it true the other way around that, that a child often feels the displeasure as well of the father? And that is a painful, sad, disheartening thing to experience. When we know our father is displeased with us, we become displeased ourselves. At least this is the way it's supposed to work. The language that Peter uses here that if you call on God as Father is very reminiscent of prayer language, isn't it? Calling on God, I think, signifies for sure us calling on him for salvation. But remember, he's writing to believers who are struggling. They're in exile. They're sojourners. They feel like they don't belong here because in one sense they do not. And so those who are strangers and sojourners, those who are without hope in this world, those who are not anchored in this world and who are anchored in God, they often find themselves calling upon God as Father. God, I'm looking to you. I'm trusting you. I'm striving to be pleasing to you. Forget about the world around me. Lord, I'm living for you. There is this, this beautiful sense of, of prayer and intimacy, and I just think it's helpful to remember, listen, I think we forget what a privilege it is to be able to call on God as Father. And part of what Peter is saying is that if you want to commune with God in this intimate relationship, if you want to enjoy sweet fellowship and communion with God as Father, you must learn to stand in awe, listen, of his position and status in your life. When you say the word, our Father in heaven, that should remind you instantly of how worthy he is of honor and respect, of how you should long to live in a way that is pleasing in his sight, to never bring reproach upon his name. I'll never forget, um, I had a friend when we were growing up, I'll never forget, I never forget being in his house, we were young at the time, and we're in his house, I, I'll never forget listening to him call his parents by their first names, okay? 
This was, this was shattering to me. This like wrecked me. I remember listening to him talk to his mom and dad, calling them by their first names. Literally, just as if it was nothing. And I remember in that moment going like, oh no. This is, hey man, it was nice to know you. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll get out of here right now. I'm sure, I'm sure that this is the end of your life. I'm sure it is. Um, only to find out that this was normal. And I couldn't believe this. I was like, this, is, this doesn't fly in my house. I mean, listen, parents, you've all had that experience, right? When your kid calls you by their first name. I'll never forget my, my son, my youngest son. I remember um, uh, just not long ago, um, he's just casually doing something at a table. And, and my wife, Sarah, was calling me from upstairs and I couldn't hear. And he goes, Dad, he, goes he turns, he's, he's listening to him. He goes, he goes, Ian, Sarah's calling you. <laughs> and listen, listen, it's cute the first time, right? You're like, oh, that's so cute. Listen, after the second, you're like, wait a second here. <laughs> You better know your role. <laughs> and listen, I, I got an amen. But li- listen, I, I'm, however you operate in your home, so I, you, 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 you know, part of my point is this. Listen, I think sometimes what Peter's concerned about here is that we can have this really casual and trivial and relaxed kind of approach to God. Listen, it, it, we take for granted that we can approach the throne of grace anytime we want. We take for granted that we can call God Abba Father. And oftentimes, if we're not careful in the Christian life, we can begin to treat God with an irreverent, casual approach that is unbecoming of who he actually is. Do you get that? And we praise God that Jesus is our friend. He is a friend of sinners. We praise God that we can march into the throne of grace. We can cling to it. Listen, but we dare not. We dare not forget who our God is and how worthy and deserving he is of our utmost respect and honor and reverence and awe. That's what Peter is concerned about. He is a father worthy of this kind of reverence and praise. And when you get this, listen, when you start seeing God like this, this kind of awe, it fuels your fear of God, which fuels your desire to live a holy and pleasing life for him. That's what Peter is wanting us to see. Your new birth into the family of God comes with great responsibility to be like your father, to be a chip off the old block, to point others to his glory, to his honor, to his praise by the way you live your life in humble obedience to him. It comes with great responsibility. I want you to notice this, though. It also comes with great accountability. A very, very neglected reality in many Christians' lives. And he not only points out that God is father, and in to calls us to call on him as father, look at what he says. He says, remember that God is judge. Remember that God is judge. And if you call on him as father, look at this, look at this language, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds. Conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile. Now, I just want you to notice this, that again, let me just reiterate, if you've missed the point of the sermon so far, this idea of conducting yourself with fear is the point of this entire passage. This is it. Live with a a fear of God. And in order to do that, in order to, to have this fear, to fuel this kind of fear, we must remember who God is. He is Father, yes, but He is Judge. There is a right sense of terror and dread, as I mentioned, when it comes to fearing God. Uh, The word of God is not shy about this. The word of God um, doesn't pull any punches. It's very clear. It's very honest about uh, how we ought to approach God. There must be, in one sense, fear and trembling. There was for many who found themselves in the very presence of God. He is a father who judges impartially. He is no respecter of persons. And he judges, notice this, according to each one's deeds. He looks at your life. He sees every action. He sees every thought. He weighs every motivation. He takes it all into account and he will render a just and righteous judgment. We saw last week again, remember that God is holy. And here we're reminded that he is just. And it's the combination of these two attributes that help fuel our fear of God. When we see God as both holy and just, we can understand what it means to stand in awe of him and to live in fear of him. You see, when we understand that God is holy, we understand that he is passionately opposed to all sin because it is direct violation and rebellion against his nature and character. And when we see that God is just, we see that he must punish all sin, that if he is to remain both holy and just, 
He can't wink at sin. He doesn't kind of sweep it under the rug. By the way, this was what God wanted to make clear at the very beginning of humanity's existence. This is what Adam knew of God's character. He knew in the garden that God was both holy and just. God had revealed himself as both holy and just. God had told Adam that he was a God of judgment. He had made it clear that if you eat of the fruit of this tree, you shall surely what? Die. That is judgment. He didn't hide this fact. He was blatantly clear about it, and that's why Adam tried to hide from God when he heard God calling for him in the garden after he had sinned. He tried to hide himself, thinking somehow, convincing himself somehow that God didn't see the sin, but deep down he hid because he knew that what he had to face was a holy God who would render just punishment. I was listening this week to a podcast, and and, uh, on the podcast, um, it was mentioned that, you know, every parent has the experience of a child, you know, finding your child hiding somewhere. You ever had that? But, but hiding because they've done something wrong. You ever had that experience as a parent? Even when, listen, even when you haven't seen them do what's wrong, they find themselves hiding anyways. In other words, there is this built-in sense of guilt and shame and this knowledge, right, that's inherent. Even if, if we're not seen by another human being, we know we have been seen by someone. We know that nothing ultimately escapes the gaze of God. You see, the gracious warnings of judgment, that's how we need to think of them, the gracious warnings of judgment, even given in the garden, were meant to be a safeguard against sin, a safeguard and protection for humanity. They were meant to help us flourish. They were meant for our joy and for our good. They were meant for our blessing. You see, that's what awe does. Awe of God is not about killing our joy. It's not about hurting our lives. It's about increasing our joy. It's about helping us live in a way that is more satisfying and more pleasing to God. It's a way that's living for our good and for our gain. And I just want to quickly highlight for you just three aspects of God's judgment that I think are necessary to help increase our awe of God. The first a sense of God's judgment. Let me just give you all three. Um, here's, if you're just kind of taking notes, we'll go through them one at a time. Here's just three aspects of God's judgment that are important to understand. One is um, the judgment of God's wrath, future wrath. The second one is future rewards. It's the positive side of judgment. And the third one is present discipline. Okay? So judgment number one, um, future wrath. As we read through scripture, we find phrases like this, um, the fury or heat of God's anger, that's Isaiah 42, 25, or, or the pouring out of God's indignation, that's Jeremiah 10, 10. I'm just, I'm just randomly selecting some verses. There's so many, it's, it's remarkable. You're like, well, you just quoted from the Old Testament. Isn't that the Old Testament God, right? Only the Old Testament God is filled with wrath and anger, Right? Only the old, that's the old, we have a God of grace and love in the New Testament. He has nothing to do with wrath anymore. You sure about that? We read expressions like this from Romans 2 verse 8, a God's wrath and fury. We read, listen to this, in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7 through 8, of the Lord Jesus, listen, this is amazing, the Lord Jesus coming with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. John the Baptist, while he was baptizing a people in a baptism of repentance before a Jesus' ministry began, he sees the Sadducees and the Pharisees coming towards him, kind of in their, their show of external religiosity, and he rebukes them, saying this, who told you to flee from the wrath to come? Have you ever wondered why Jesus Christ describes hell with such vivid imagery? Like, why? Have you ever wondered why Jesus talks so much about the reality of hell? Why does God's word make such profound and potent statements about God's anger and wrath and judgment, his vengeance upon sin and sinners? 
Here's why. Listen, listen. So that all humanity will realize that it is indeed a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. The thought of future wrath and judgment is intended to incite true trembling and fear in our hearts. Here's what one author said. Listen to this. It's only ignorance of the character of God or spiritual insanity that would keep a man from this type of fear of God if he were in the path that leads to God's judgment. You're going to be crazy. You either have to be ignorant to who God is or you have to be utterly crazy to know that this is who God is and to forget about his wrath and judgment that is to come. You see, the Bible tells us that when that day of God's wrath actually arrives, it tells us with vivid imagery that people around the globe will cry out for the rocks and the hills to fall on them and hide them from the face, listen to this, from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, Revelation 6, 16. And you see, God has hardwired all of humanity to know him as judge. Romans 1.32 says that we all know God's decree or righteous judgment that because of sin we deserve to die. God has given to us the gift of conscience to either accuse us of sin and the knowledge of God's impending judgment or to excuse us. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because humanity has a terrifying ability to disregard these graces of God and to continue in sin and down the path of final judgment. Isn't it amazing? I, I, I am just shocked by this. People who even believe this but are still so content to walk the path of sin, to forget about surrendering their life to Jesus Christ, to know that this is likely going to be the outcome of their life and the outcome of their eternity. Can I just tell you the single most important statement that sums up the sinner's hard-heartedness and sinful living is found in Romans chapter 3 where Paul, quoting from the Old Testament, describes the nature of sin and the sinner. And he talks about the wickedness of humanity and he gets down to Romans 3.18 and here's what he says. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's it. And if you're an unbeliever here today, I, I want you to hear um, this with a, a, an impassioned plea for your soul. Can I just tell you that, listen, Christian, let me just speak to you, Chris. Christian, knowing this truth is one of the greatest motivators towards evangelizing the lost, okay? If you believe this truth, if you believe this truth, that sinners are headed on a path to eternal wrath and destruction, you must share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Amen? You must, that, that wasn't good enough. Did you just hear how quiet? No, no, hold on, hold on. Did you hear how quiet that was? This is, this is my fear. This is my fear for my own heart. This is my fear for your heart. We say we believe these things, but we don't actually live these things. This is a, listen, this is a huge, huge wake-up call for the church, okay? This is a massive deal. If we truly fear God, if we truly fear that others, if not ourselves, are going to be encountering the wrath of God, how come we're not telling people how they can be spared from the wrath that's to come? How come? Why? I, I don't, listen, I don't get it. I don't get it in my life. Or not. All I can chalk it up to is this, sin. And you know what the reality is? Here's the problem in the Christian life. We fear for sure. We fear a lot of things. We just don't fear God more than we fear the men of this world. We're so fearful of our reputations being marred. We're so fearful of what's gonna cost us financially, physically. We're so fearful of so many things, but we're not fearful of the right thing. We're not fearful of God himself. And I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying this as, as a solo rebuke to you. I'm saying this as a rebuke to my heart. I need this like you need this. I'm ashamed at how infrequently I share the gospel when I know the truth of Jesus Christ. I'm ashamed, I'm embarrassed by how, listen, how I lack, I lack in a seriousness to call people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Like shame on me, but listen, shame on us. We are the church of the living God. We know the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the only hope for salvation and yet we keep our mouths shut and we live as if it doesn't matter. How can this be? How can this be? God help us, amen? 
God, help us. God, burden us. God, remind us that you are the judge of this universe. People are going to stand face to face before God, and their eternity is at stake. God, help us to see every person, not as somebody who is temporary, but somebody who is eternal. Not as somebody, listen, who is going to be walking into necessarily a future filled with glory, but a future filled with heartache and terror. If you're an unbeliever here today, please, could you, just, could you hear the heart behind? This is not like we want to judge you. you know, like we're, our fear is that God is going to judge you. That's the fear. And our passionate plea to you is be made right with God. Don't wait until it's too, you don't want to stand before this God where he will look at every one of your deeds and he will assess the motive and everything will be revealed and it will show that you don't love God, you never knew God, you never lived for God, and instead you will get exactly what you wanted in this life, an eternity away from God. You will experience what you don't realize, eternal suffering, eternal pain, eternal regret. And the awful reality of God's wrath against sin should halt us in our tracks, if you're a Christian, from running headlong into sin, shouldn't it? Like, if you know, if you know what this is going to cost people, how can we keep walking in it? Do you see how he's trying to motivate? Don't you understand? You stand in awe of God. You're going to judge sin. He's going to judge sin. You better run as far and as fast away from sin as you possibly can. You better make this a priority in your life. Get away from sin. People are going to be judged for eternity because of this sin. Your Savior was judged on your behalf because of this sin. You better run far from it and get fast away. It's a heavy judgment. There is a, a positive side of judgment. You're like, phew, now I can breathe just for a moment. Can I just tell you, Christian, especially if you're a follower of Jesus Christ today, listen, there is a second kind of judgment, and that is the judgment of future rewards. Now, I believe that's primarily, primarily what Peter is talking about here. He puts this in the context of judging each one's deeds. Now, typically, whenever that's referenced in Scripture, that points towards the reality of a future judgment, that as believers, listen, we will stand before God, and all of our deeds are going to be assessed, and by the grace of God, listen, if you're in Jesus Christ, there is now, therefore, no condemnation for you. Hallelujah, right? And here's the reality. Your deeds will be put on display before God too. All of your good deeds, all of your efforts, everything you've ever, all of your motivations, they're going to be assessed by God. And in the end, God is going to sift them through his, his divine holiness sift, and he will just hold forth those things that are actually pleasing to him. They were good deeds, good works that lined up with the will of God that were pleasing in his sight and were done with a pure motivation for the glory of his name. He's going to hold those forward, and he's going to reward you for that. And you see, I, I believe that Peter is holding this out to us, this reminder that God, you know, he, he's not this impartial judge, or excuse, partial judge, excuse me, he, he is impartial in his judgments. You say, well, why does he want us to know that when it, when it comes to future rewards? Because, listen, while we rightly celebrate that there's therefore no, no condemnation in Christ Jesus, I mean, we run the risk of doing what Paul warns against in Romans chapter 6. So, should we just continue to sin so that grace may abound? I mean, we can keep sinning, right? Because God keeps forgiving. Like, who really cares? Do you see the problem? If we have this mindset about who God is and how he's going to judge because we're in Christ, then that can lead us to a Christian life of complacency where we lack a perspective on holy living that is pleasing to God. And Paul confronts this reality in Romans chapter 6, doesn't he? So should, should we keep living so that, you know, in sin so that grace may abound? What does he say? May it never be. Say, no, how can we, if we live like that, we actually misunderstand the grace of God. We misunderstand the seriousness of our sin, and we misunderstand and mischaracterize the holiness of the God who has saved us. Each one of us will be judged according to our deeds. This is a pervasive theme in scripture. I'm just gonna throw a couple um, scriptures up on the screen. Now let's go with uh, Romans 14, 18 through 12. Paul says this, he says, why do you pass judgment on your brother or you, why do you despise your brother? Remember he's writing to Christians, for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us, each of us, this is you and me, 
will give an account of, God, of himself to God. Uh, Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9 through 11. He says this, so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. So this is living in the fear of God right here. We, uh, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. See, see the motivation? We live to please him. That's what it means to really fear God, to live in awe of him. We live to please him. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. God knows. God's going to look at everything in our lives. God is going to give us a righteous judgment. You see, we need a holy dread of God, not a crippling dread, okay? Not the kind of crippling dread that keeps us in a place of self-condemnation, of paralysis, you know, where we're constantly questioning. We're walking around, you know, you've all seen that. Maybe you've even been that. Maybe that's you today. You walk around in constant fear. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to do this. Uh, is this going to be okay? You're, just, you're constantly second-guessing. You're constantly questioning. You're crippled by your fear. That's not the kind of fear that we're talking about here. We are talking about the kind of fear that keeps us back from sin and that keeps us pressing on in holiness, the kind that is confidently affirming this truth. I know this is wrong, and I refuse to do it. Or I know this is right, and I refuse not to do it. I know what God wants of me. I know what it means to be pleasing His sight. I know that he deserves the honor and praise and the glory for how I live my life, and I am going to commit to doing it. I'm so confident in my desire to please the Lord. It is my one aim. It's the single thing I am worried about in this life. So forgetting what lies ahead and pressing on to what lies, or forgetting what lies behind, that works better. Pressing on to what lies ahead, I'm gonna strain forward for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Everything I have, it's going towards this. Is this your life, Christian? If this doesn't in any way describe a desire in your heart, you've seared your conscience so badly or you have quiet, quieted the Spirit's work in your heart so significantly that you should be scared right now. The other reality is this, is this has never been a desire for you to live a holy life. If it's never been a desire to be pleasing to the Lord, you just need to hear this very clearly. The reality may be this is you've never been saved. If your desire isn't to please the Lord, if your desire is not to live in holy lives, these are fruits of the Spirit. These are things the Spirit of God provokes in our hearts. And so if you're not seeing any desire, any kind of effort in this direction, you need to seriously pause and question this today, and then you need to say, well, what if I, what if I realize I'm not really saved today? What, what do I do if this is not a desire of my heart? What do I do if I feel like I am saved, but it's, I've just crushed the spirit of God's presence in my life and his voice in my heart and soul? I can't hear it any longer. The answer is the same. Get on your face before God. Repent in dust and ashes. Plead with him to restore to you the joy of your salvation. Plead with him for a holy passion for his glory. Plead Plead with him for a fear of him that propels you forward in the Christian life. Plead with him and don't get off your knees until he gives it to you. Like wrestle with God like Jacob wrestled with God. And if you've got to walk away with a limp, then walk away with a limp. Whatever God's got to do to break you down, whatever God's got to do to wound you so that you turn from your sin and you look to him and you pursue him in holiness, that's what you need. And you've got to start pleading with God to do that. And you've got to repent and trust, listen, that God in his grace and kindness will provide it. The third judgment that we see in scripture is a present discipline. And here's what I mean by that. There ought to be a, a, a fear of a fatherly discipline in our lives. You know, a Hebrews 12 kind of discipline where every, every father who loves his, his child, he disciplines his child and he does it with a goal towards their holiness and towards their growth. You see, that discipline of, of a, a loving father is always intended to produce results. It's always intended, every discipline that a parent gives is intended to be a deterrent towards behavior that is damaging to them and dishonoring to God, amen? Like, this is the goal. This is God's goal with you and me. And sometimes in the Christian life, listen, God has to come alongside us because we continue to press on in sin. We continue to choose sin over choosing holiness. And God, in his love and grace, will discipline us. And sometimes that discipline is very painful. But God, in his love, will come alongside and he'll give us a holy spanking, right? 
And he'll let us know, listen, you're not walking the path of righteousness and my desire is for your good. And I think one of the things we lose, you know, one of the disciplines of the Lord, I believe, listen, when God is disciplining us because we're shooting, this this should terrify you if you're a Christian. It, It is losing the experience of God's presence in your life. You know what that's like? You know what it's like to be walking with the Lord so closely, to have a heart so in tune with the Spirit of God in your life, to see the progress and the fruitfulness, to see God using you in such sweet ways. You know the joy of the Lord that that, that, that kind of accompanies that kind of disposition before the Lord? Do you know what it's like to lose that? Do you know what it's like to choose sin over holiness and then all of a sudden to feel like you are distant and alienated from God? To, to feel like you're constantly fearful of your, the assurance of your salvation even? We've we got to long not to lose the presence of God, the, the, the experience of his presence. God never leaves us. Listen, his spirit's still there. Listen, but we, we lose the experience and the joy and the freedom of his presence that he wants us to know and love. John Calvin, when he looked at the judgment of God in his institutes, Calvin's institutes, he said these words. I'll put it on the screen here. He says this, uh, because... It sees him to be a righteous judge armed with severity to punish wickedness. It even holds his judgment seat before its gaze. And through fear of him restrains itself from provoking his anger. Besides, this mind restrains itself from sinning, not out of dread of punishment alone, but because it loves and reveres God as Father. It worships and adores him as Lord. You see, fear and love are actually not two things that are distinct from one another. When it comes to truly fear in the Lord, it is one of the deepest expressions of our love for the Lord. You see, we live in greater awe of God when we remember that God is judge when we call upon him as father. And these are intended to fuel our fear of God so that we can conduct ourselves, as he says here, with fear during our time of exile. It's easy, listen, in our time of exile, in a place that's not our home. You see, why does he put this in again? He wants us to remember, listen, that it's so often we're tempted by the things of this world. We're tempted to compromise. We're tempted to sin. We're tempted to capitulate. We're tempted to give in. We're tempted to throw the towel in on holiness because the world around us is putting such immense pressure on us to conform to their standards. And so he tells us, listen, the key, the key to encounter Countering this kind of pressure from the world and the temptation of your own sinful flesh is this. Fear God. Stand in awe of him, not in awe of any man. The second thing he says, that, you know, after a greater awe of God, if we want to fuel this fear of God, he says this. Here it is. We need a greater appreciation of grace. We need a greater appreciation of grace. He branches into verse 18 here. He says, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He continues this sentence, fueling our fear of God by drawing our attention back to the gospel of God's grace. And again, we see here that our fear is really not distinct from our love. Our love and our affection for God is rooted in the gospel, and our fear of God is birthed from all of that. He says here that we are to be knowing something very important. Verse 18, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. You need to know what God has done to save you. And so if you want a greater appreciation of grace, you know, here's what he wants us to do. He wants us to get our gaze back on God's grace. And so here's what he says. You need, you need to see this, okay? I am redeemed from the pervasive plight of sin. That's what you got to know. I'm, per, I'm redeemed from the per, pervasive plight of sin. I made that way too wordy. I can't even pronounce it. But, but just catch this. Listen, you were ransomed, he said. You, you got to remember. You, you want to have a fear of God? You want to stand in, in, in an appreciation of God's grace? You were ransomed. That word reminds us that we have been redeemed and liberated. We have been purchased out of a dire situation. People in the Old Testament were ransomed from all kinds of, of plights in life. Immense debt that they could never pay back. Indentured servitude or slavery. They were purchased out of being executed. Things that they couldn't get out of themselves. Somebody had to come alongside and buy them out of that situation. And here's what Peter wants to remind us. Listen, you ought to fear God and you ought to appreciate his grace because God has done this for you.
And this is the sense of what he wants to do with the gospel. He wants us to look at the gospel, and he wants us to look at God's grace, and he wants us to see this. Listen, this is what God's done for you. This is what God has done for you. And if you understand what God has done for you, how can you continue to persist in sin? He's trying to halt us again in our tracks, in our desire to pursue sin. He's like, hold on, think of the gospel. Let the gospel grip your heart instead of your sin. This is such a theologically potent term, this idea of ransom, of redemption. It reminds us of the pervasive plight of sin. Pervasive in the sense that it is all-encompassing. We were completely corrupted by sin. Every part of us, every part of this universe is thrust into sin because of rebellion against God. It is alienated from God and from intimacy with him. And and he says here, he points this idea of this pervasiveness. He says the, the ways that are inherited by or from your forefathers. He looks back at their heritage. He looks back at maybe their pagan lifestyle. It doesn't even matter. Any religious lifestyle, any uh, philosophy of life or ideology that was inherited from somewhere or someone anywhere in the past is worthless and futile, he says. It is empty. It is devoid of any hope. It cannot save you. It cannot break the bonds of sin. It cannot relieve the judgment of God. None of it will do, no matter how hard you try, no matter how much you give, no matter how how many times you attend, none of it is going to do. You can't fix this problem. Futile, empty, worthless. No other way can make the proper payment. No other way has the divine power necessary. No other way can remove the just penalty. Listen to what Titus 2.14 says. He says, talking about Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. You see, sin had locked us up. Lawlessness had ruled our lives and our hearts. It has shackled, it controlled us, it dominated us, it owned us. We were a prisoner of sin. Nothing we could do, nothing we could do could not escape its influence or its judgment. And this is the case for all humanity without exception. And what we need is to be redeemed. We need to be bought out of that kind of pervasive plight, of that kind of bondage. We need to be liberated and set free from that. And that is exactly what God has done in his grace. The sin that bound you has now been loosed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, by the grace of God for you, because you could not do it for yourself. And this is what we know as followers of Jesus Christ you know, the, the captive, the prisoner of, of war who's been liber- liberated from their enemies. Can you imagine? Can you imagine somebody who is set free in the midst of wartime, liberated by, by, by somebody on their, in their own army? Can you imagine them getting to safety and getting to freedom and then crawling back into the same prison that they were liberated from? How foolish would that be? What do you, you've been set free. You don't have to live in this cell anymore. You don't have to be ruled by this master anymore. You can walk in freedom. And it's for freedom that Christ has set you free today. And we ought to refuse to go back when we think about how God has liberated us. I'm not going back to that sin anymore. I'm not going back there anymore. I'm a debtor to his grace. See, why why do we knew this? Because we, we sang this, right? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. If we get our hearts back to the gospel, we're reminded, listen, of the God who loves us so we can be reminded of how we ought to love him. Secondly, see this, I am redeemed with the priceless payment of Christ. I love, I love how Peter elevates the work of Christ here. He talks about how we were purchased, what we were purchased with, knowing that you were ransomed from these feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. 
so good. The, the irony here in the, the precious metals he chooses, isn't that, isn't that awesome, right? He calls these precious metal, metals perishable, right? The earthly metals of silver and gold, these above all el- others are earth's most precious metals, the most lasting metals. But Peter here makes them look like mere sticks and stones. It's like these things are worthless. They're temporary. They have no value compared to our purchase price. You want to know what God paid to purchase you out of the slave market of sin? Here it is, the precious blood of Christ. That's how much you are worth to God. We were bought with a price. Ephesians 1 verse 7 says this, in him we have redemption through his blood. There's no other way. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Our salvation was costly. Listen to this, Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Our salvation was priceless in value. That's what Peter wants you to see. The idea of precious there points to this, how priceless this is, the immense value that we cannot accurately calculate. You see, the value of the life of Jesus really is determined in two primary ways. And these two primary ways are really defined by the requirements of God. Okay, God required from humanity total perfection. That's the first requirement. Total perfection, a perfect obedience. But because of sin, God now requires as well an eternal payment for sin. You see, we need... A total perfection, his human perfection. That's what Jesus provided. And here, his perfect life is being put on display. His life here is being symbolized by his blood. Um, This is what Leviticus teaches. The the life is in the blood. It's a picture of, of life. But his perfection here is symbolized in the sacrificial imagery that he uses. Christ's obedience, what made him perfect, his active obedience, the, the lamb without blemish or spot. Do you see that there? This is why you can't earn your salvation. No matter how hard you try, you have sinned. You are not perfect. You have spots and blemishes. And God had given to Israel, his people, a perpetual reminder of this. They couldn't save themselves. Their their sin made them so dirty before God. They needed a substitute. They needed something that was perfect to take their place. And they were perpetually reminded of this in the sacrificial system that God had so graciously given them. They knew that a perfect spotless lamb was required. They knew that God demanded perfection. And the man Christ Jesus was perfect in every way. He said this, I always do the will of my Father. No sin Not in action, not in thought, not in motive. Never once did he violate the law of God. He walked in perfect unity with the Father, never rebelling in any way, shape, or form. And therefore, he becomes the perfect, spotless, unblemished Lamb of God, slain for the sins of the world. We needed a perfect substitute a human substitute. But, notice this, that because the payment we owed was eternal in nature, we owed an eternal payment. This is what sin has required. The shedding of blood here signifies the death of Jesus. It signifies for us the eternal consequence of sin, separation and alienation from God, a just punishment for sin. And by the way, this just punishment is described throughout the New Testament as eternal. Jesus himself talked more about the eternal reality and nature of sin than anyone else. He talked about it as as the place where the worm never dies, the flames never go out. It is a very real place that is eternal in nature according to Jesus. We don't understand what exactly it will look like in its fullness. We know that the imagery that's being used describes for us uh, and tries to paint for us a picture of something that our minds cannot fully comprehend. And by the way, what Jesus describes is terrifying and horrifying, and it is described in human language, but we need to understand this. It is far worse than anything we could possibly fathom. 
far worse. The punishment for sin is eternal. Catch this. This is such an important theological point. It is eternal because the God we have sinned against is eternal. Okay? That's why the payment must be eternal. We've said this before, but this, I, there's such a fundamental misunderstanding of this in many people's lives, and this is so helpful for you in even explaining the gospel to people. You need to be able to explain why punishment is eternal. The punishment for sin is eternal because the God we've sinned against is eternal. The value of our sin is determined by the value of the one we've sinned against, okay? That is, like, notch that into your mind. The value of our sin is determined by the value of the one we've sinned against. That that's why any sin, it doesn't matter what it is, doesn't matter how heinous you think it is, any sin is worthy of eternal punishment because it is sin and rebellion against an eternal God. And here's the awesome news of the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus' payment is priceless because he himself is priceless. Jesus' payment is eternal because he himself is eternal. You see, we needed one who is a perfect human and an eternal God to meet both requirements of God. And they mesh together beautifully in the grace of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bought us with the most priceless object in the universe, himself. Grace is both free and costly and it requires from us an appreciation that now produces a greater fear of God that leads us to a greater obedience to God. Lastly, note this, I am redeemed by the predetermined plan of God. You want to fuel the appreciation for God's grace, just look at these verses. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. God has always planned on giving us a divine payment for sin. He always planned it. He says here that Jesus was foreknown before the foundation of the world. This is the same word that Peter uses earlier for us being foreknown by God. This does not mean, by the way, that God looked ahead and he simply knew that Jesus was going to become our Savior. It doesn't mean he looked down the corridors of time and he thought that Jesus might accomplish this or he realized Jesus was going to do this. This means before the foundation of the earth. Listen, this was the predetermined plan of God. Before this universe was ever created, created, that one Adam had been created, God thought of a perfect plan to save lost sinners and restore them back to himself. How awesome is that? You're like, why does, why does Peter include it here as a part of his argument? Because God's purpose in ransoming sinners, he wants us to know this, listen, was not an afterthought. <laughs> It was a plan conceived in the heart of God before time began. And if his plan of salvation was conceived with such purpose and specificity, with such exactness, here's what you get to know, Christian. You were part of that predetermined plan. God thought of you. You are not an accident. Your life is not an afterthought. Your salvation is not a surprise. God had it planned out from eternity past. In his grace, he knew exactly what he was going to do, broadly speaking, to save lost sinners, and he knew with exact specificity who he was going to come after and save. If you can't appreciate God's grace knowing that, I don't know what else to say to you. When we get the specificity of God's, not just the overarching sovereignty of God's plan to send Jesus, you know, to, to make a plan to restore us back, to have him die on a cross. How, this is so beautiful, to raise victoriously from the grave. That's what he describes right here. If you get that God planned that in, in his sovereignty and you get that God specifically planned to come after you, God had his eye set on you, you can appreciate his grace like few others. Did you catch this? He did it for our sake. He was made manifest in these last times. Listen, we live in, in the most privileged times of all. He was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you 
who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. God conquered our great problem. God dealt with sin. He raised, from, raised him from the grave. Jesus Christ was raised victorious over sin and death. Penalty paid for in full. Seated him at the right hand of the Father, gave him glory. Why? 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 Look at this. Here's the reason. So that your faith and hope are in God. Oh, how this ought to give us a greater appreciation for grace. This is what God did for me. So much grace in this text, so much grace intended to fuel our fear of God. And here we see what Peter is driving at. Listen, wherever you're at in this life, whatever you face, God saved you so that your faith and hope can be in him. You don't have to fear anyone else. You don't have to put your faith, your trust in anything else. Nothing else will do. You don't have to hope in salvation from anyone or anything else. All you need to do is look to God. This ought to fuel our fear of God. We fear God, not men. We live to please God, not men. We are debtors of God's grace, joyfully living to the praise of his glorious grace. You see, the fear of God is fueled by a greater awe of God and a greater appreciation of his grace. And when we get this, we look to God alone. And when we look to God alone, we learn to live for God alone. Now, in our time of exile, and forever in the day of glory. Let's pray. Father, we pray uh, that you would stir our hearts afresh. Uh, We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for, God, how it uh, brings conviction, and yet at the same time, encouragement. God, how it breaks us down, and how it builds us up. God, how it points out of flaws and sin and failures, but how, Lord, it draws us back to repentance and mercy and grace. Thank you, Lord, for the grace that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that you have called us to yourself, that you call us, Lord, now to walk uh, in newness of life in the fear of you. And we pray, Father, that you would increase our desire to love you alone, uh, to put our faith and hope in you alone. And God, we pray that you would help us to live for your glory alone. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.